Alrighty, let's get going. So the last couple of lectures we talked about transactions and more recently we started talking about logging and how you can use logging as a way of uh, recovering from a variety of different failure modes uh, in the database. So today we're going to continue that and uh, specifically focus on uh, the recovery portion of that. So we, we discussed how, uh, how you generate a log. Now we're going to uh, move on to how you actually use that log. Uh, in particular, we're going to focus on an algorithm that is quite prevalent in uh, old school database systems, uh, Oracle, DB2, yada, 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 um, th uh, that is essentially uh, that does this recovery process. Um, and that algorithm is called Ares. Uh, before I get into before I get into that, a uh, couple of quick notes. Uh, uh, checkpoint 3, the overall uh, goals for Checkpoint 3 have been posted. Uh, you should find it, um, I'm hoping, substantially easier than Checkpoint 2. Uh, the basic brunt of it is that you're going to be expected to uh, I incorporate indexing into your system. Uh, now there's a whole variety of different indexing um, libraries that have been released on the internet. Uh, and what we'll be doing for this assignment is using one of those libraries as uh, sort of a baseline. So kind of like uh, JSQL parser, you kind of incorporated that into your uh, runtimes. Uh, we're going to have another library for you to use called JDBM2. Uh, if you're familiar with Berkeley DB, it's essentially a simpler open source version of the same thing. Um, and basically, I've uh, played with it for a bit. It's, it's actually quite... Uh, it's surprisingly simple. You'll, you'll find uh, that it provides a large portion of the, the, uh, B tree, uh, the indexing functionality that you need to actually support uh, your, um, uh, your, your use of indexes. Uh, the reference implementation as of right now uh, integrates the uh, JDBM2 and uses it as sort of the primary storage layer uh, for all of the data. Uh, the main distinction between uh, the way that your assignments are going to be tested for the different checkpoints, um, in checkpoint three, uh, you'll be subjected to a much smaller data set. Uh, there will also be substantially more, uh, more uh, grading boxes uh, that should be up by the time you start submitting these. Uh, the, in addition to, oh, sorry, that should be a five. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the basic uh, query processing stages that you're familiar with from checkpoints one and two, now you're going to have a, uh, now you're going to have a uh, five minute, that's, let me actually fix that. Um, you're going to have a five minute uh, opportunity to do any kind of pre-computation you want. Um, the reference implementation uses this time period to uh, build a set of indexes. Uh, another useful thing that you might want to do is uh, gather uh, various statistics about the data that you're going to be working with. Um, and, but basically, we're not limiting you. Uh, anything you want to do during that five minute stage, it's pretty much uh, open ended. Uh, the only catch is that you, you can't go over five minutes. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, the details are posted and we'll be going over it in a little more detail on Wednesday. We'll also have assignment four posted relatively soon. Um, that, uh, sorry, uh, checkpoint four posted relatively soon. Uh, the goal there is going to be uh, to do some transactional processing on top of all of this. Um, one note, checkpoint three should not uh, rely too heavily on a working checkpoint two implementation. Okay, um, the other thing is please stay after class. Uh, towards the end of class, we'll be returning assignment four. So if you'd like to pick that up, um, that'll be available immediately after class. So don't run off uh, too soon. Okay, great. Um, any questions? Yes? Uh, the optional checkpoint four will be due uh, basically as. I will 
push the deadline off for that as long as possible while still giving me an opportunity to get the grades in on time. Uh, I believe the latest I can go for that, the absolute, 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 absolute latest that I can go for that is May 19th. So uh, that, is, that is a hard constraint imposed on me from the outside. So uh, I, I would love to be able to grant an extension on that, uh, but I, I will not be able to. OK, any other questions? All right. Uh, so let's go on. Uh, recall, last, uh, <clears throat> last class we talked about uh, logging, and in, in particular this idea that uh, if the system crashes, we need to be able to uh, recover the database back to a consistent state. And Thank you. Uh, we can... Thank you. So we want to be able to recover the database back to a consistent state after the transaction has been, uh, after the system has crashed. Um, what is a consistent state? Well, any kind of database operations that have uh, been per performed by a transaction that committed by the time the crash occurred uh, should be durable, should, be, should reside on disk, and any, uh, any operations that have been performed by a op uh, transaction that has not yet committed uh, should, be, uh, should leave no trace. This kind of connects to this uh, very stringent set of principles that most database systems try and enforce called ACID, uh, atomicity, uh, consistency, isolation, and durability. And in particular, what we're trying to address are the atomicity, uh, consistency, and durability properties. Uh, concretely, uh, the atomicity property uh, <clears throat> requires that we kind of commit the entire transaction in a single step. Uh, there is kind of a, a point before the transaction is committed, and there's a point after the transaction is committed. And uh, ideally, that, that kind of one point shouldn't take, uh, should be atomic. You should be able to kind of distinguish on which side you're on at all times. Uh, durability. So there's this uh, possibility that we may need to uh, buffer certain rights that get performed over the course of the transaction. And we want to make sure that if those things are buffered and the transaction commits, that they get correctly reflected to disk. But if we're buffering things, uh, buffering takes up memory. And as I'm sure you all know from checkpoint two at this point, memory is not infinite. So uh, we might potentially want to take those, uh, those operations that we've buffered, those write operations that are, are kind of sitting waiting to, to happen, and roll them back to an earlier state, uh, undo them. So we need to be able to, to kind of incorporate uh, some way of, of recovering from a, a transaction that decides to abort. So let's look at these properties one at a time. Um, the first atomicity. So the, the challenge that we're trying to overcome is that we have the disk gives us a very simple primitive. Uh, we can write a page to disk. Or we can perform some kind of write and then get some kind of guarantee that that write has completed either in whole or in part. And the difficulty is that, well, what happens if we crash? What uh, if we perform one write but not another, uh, that leaves the database in this weird state that is not entirely committed but not entirely uh, boarded either. And so what we introduced last week is, is this idea of logging. Um, quick correction on something I said. Uh, what I was referring to was not a log-based file system, it was a journaling file system. So the idea is basically, the idea that we discussed was that every time you do something, every time you perform an update, every time you abort, any, every time you commit, every time you do anything that could potentially modify the state of the database, you first record that operation in a log. So as soon as, and you do this, you make sure that everything that you need to be logged uh, is safely logged on disk before you actually start 
uh, messing around with the actual data. So how does that help us? So at the very end here, if we crash after we've overwritten all of the file blocks, what happens? With respect to this transaction, at least. Hmm? Yes, it's consistent. Thank you. Uh, one person is awake. Um, all right, so it's consistent. After, uh, at this point, everything is safe. At this point, it's also consistent because the transaction hasn't done anything. So there's kind of this middle period where uh, the uh, we're potentially in an inconsistent state. So we need to be able to uh, recover from that. So what happens if the system crashes while we're writing to the log? Yes? Okay, so before we get to the end of this point, before we get to this little point here, uh, the database, the database itself, hasn't actually been modified. Nothing is nothing, nothing has changed. So because of that, we're still consistent basically until we start writing file blocks. What happens here? What happens if we crash during this period? Okay, so the data is, database is inconsistent, but Right, so we, we've essentially written everything that we're about to do. So if the database crashes while we're, while we're sitting in this period, all we have to do is replay the sequence of operations and we've gotten the new state. Great. All right, so that helps us out with the atomicity prob uh, problem. Now what about this, this durability consistency issue? Well, this was raised last class. Uh, this idea that buffer memory, the amount of space that we have uh, available to, to cache data, is limited. We don't have uh, a lot of space to work with. So we'd like to have some way of essentially uh, what uh, in a database would, or what in an operating system would be considered virtual memory. We'd like to be able to uh, flush data back to disk. So Basically, the question is, how do we do this page out process? How do we uh, take a, a piece of data that has been written and write it back to disk? Well, there's a handful of ways that we could address that. We could uh, potentially, um, we could potentially uh, just rely on the log itself or some sort of uh, vir uh, virtual memory uh, swap file. But then what is, what does that cause? What, is, uh, what if we take every uh, buffer that has been modified and write it to disk? What is, uh, is that going to lead to? So let's say a transaction comes along and modifies record A. And then another transaction comes along. It needs that chunk of memory. That write to A needs to get uh, paged back to disk. What are we going to do with that, uh, that chunk of memory? Write it back to disk. But where do we write it? Do we write it back to the original file? Do we write it to a swap file? Do we write it to the log? OK, so we might want to write it to uh, the log and then to a swap file. OK. So. That's one possibility. We can write it to a swap file or to the log or uh, basically to some place where we can recover it. What does that mean for the commit? So when we decide to commit, what do we need to do at that point? Okay, so we need to, when we decide to commit, we need to write the data back to the original, the database file. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to first Load the, thing, uh, load the data from the swap file and write it back to disk. Now this is a bit of a problem because what happens if the, uh, because we generally kind of want to assume that transactions are going to commit more frequently than they abort. So as a bit of an optimization, what will often happen is 
it, or what happens in most database systems is that the date uh, <coughs> is that that page will actually get flushed directly into the database file. Instead of uh, flushing the, the data to a swap file, instead of flushing it to the log, it's actually going to get sent directly into the database file on disk. Now, this has an advantage. It means our commits are uh, much, much cheaper because we don't need to load any, anything back into memory. What's the downside? OK, so one downside is that there's an inconsistent state if the system crashes. So it will be slow because every time we want to modify the database, we end up having to write that data. I see. So uh, by if every time we flush something, we flush it to the database file, that will slow things down because it. Uh, we're essentially blocking on that one file. Uh, that is true, although in general, what, what are we going to be blocking on? Uh, the file or the disk? If, if the file spans The file spans multiple pages. We need to lock all of the pages. Otherwise, we can lock only a single page. Uh, I mean, in general, the, the granularity at which you lock depends on your system. If you want to create a, struct a locking structure where you lock every single page individually and allow individual writes to pages, uh, if you go with a low and low enough level system, you can you can. There's no difference between a single file that's really big, and a series of very small files. Uh, the limiting factor in each of these cases is typically typically going to be the disk and not the file that you're modifying. Uh, and in fact, there are, even in Java there are ways of having multiple uh, multiple threads accessing different portions of a file at the same time. Uh, so the other major difficulty that you're going to encounter in this case uh, isn't uh, necessarily a, a performance issue, but if you have an abort, you need a way of uh, undoing the effects of your transaction. So you've, you've buffered all of these things, you've flushed the buffer back to disk, and you've wiped out the older version of, of the data. So now you, now you need a way of, of going back to the original version. And so the log uh, is potentially one way of doing that. Uh, the other thing, uh, yeah. So we can kind of do that by recording not only the the regular records that we're keeping, uh, not uh, not only the the forward changes, the the uh, updates that we're performing, but every time we perform an update, we can also record uh, the previous value of the data that we're uh, overwriting. So by doing that, we can kind of look at the log in reverse. We'll go back in time and try and figure out, uh, try and undo all of the, the operations that we've performed. And again, there's some issues with uh, crashing here that we'll get, get back to in a couple of slides. OK, so this is kind of the, the general structure of the problems. Does everyone kind of get the, uh, the need for uh, the ability to undo transactions and the ability to replay uh, log entries to, to reconstruct data that you've lost. Any questions up to this point? Yes? So the question is, is logging required uh, irrespective of whether or not we're writing to a swap file or 
uh, or directly to the disk. Um, the, uh, there are a variety of different benefits that you get from, from logging. So even if you wrote to a swap file, there is still an advantage to keeping, tra keeping a log, not so much for undos, but for, re uh, for redos, to be able to, to reconst uh, reconstruct a, a state after a crash. Um, the, advantage to logging the advantage to logging in this case, if you are, let me back up a little. So even if you're writing to a swap file, there's still some advantage in using this particular, uh, using a, a log to keep track of, of the operations that you've performed. Uh, not so much for crash recovery, but simply to undo things. Um, it allows you to figure out how to uh, reconstruct a given buffer from the modified buffer. Um, As, as with most of these things, it kind of depends on precisely the set of operations that you're using. But for example, if you're not using optimistic concurrency control, um, if you're using some sort of locking scheme, uh, which means you only have one version of the data to worry about, then this will, this will allow you to abort a transaction without needing to keep the older version of the data. Does that? Uh, makes sense. And does that address your general question about logging? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So we've kind of introduced the specific problems that we're trying to address with logging. And there are other things that logging will help you do. These are kind of the, the, core, uh, the core ones that have been kind of in addressed by databases for decades now. Let's actually have a look at the logs themselves. So there are three kind of pieces, three big pieces that uh, fit together in this giant uh, mechanism that is logging and recovery. And the first of them is the log itself. So what goes into a log entry? Um, I had a slide on this. I, actually, this is hopefully a little bit simpler. There are basically four different things that you want to record. Uh, so first off, you want to keep track of which transaction performed a given operation. If you're going to use a, a log to uh, abort a transaction, you want to have a way of kind of picking out which uh, log entries pertain to a given transaction. Uh, you also want to be able to quickly jump between different log entries for a given transaction. So the uh, the log entries for a given transaction are typically organized together in a sort of linked list. Um, and this is done by keeping track, every transaction keeping track of the previous log entry for that specific transaction. And finally, you have the actual log entry itself. So there's some type of entry. We discussed a couple of these last time, abort, commit, uh, update. And any relevant metadata that tells us what precisely the transaction or that operation did. Uh, if it's an update, for example, uh, we might want to keep track of what was written, where it was written, and um, what the previous value was in that spot. Any questions? All right. So that's the first of these three big parts that, that fit into the system, the log itself. Now, the log itself uh, gives us a record of what has been happening. We also want to keep track of what's going on right now. So the, the kind of core primitive, the core thing that we, we keep track of, the, the core entity, uh, the set of entities that, were, that are acting, or the core set of actors in this setting, are transactions. Each transaction is going to be performing a set of operations. So another major component of this system is going to be a, a list of all of the transactions that are currently active. 
or uh, let me rephrase that, a list of all of the transaction that, transactions that are currently doing something. So for each of these transactions, we want to keep track of a handful of things. Uh, first, we want to know what its status is. So which phase the transaction is in, if we're using optimistic concurrency control, um, whether the transaction is active, uh, whether it is in the process of, of committing, whether we're uh, in the process of aborting it, um, essentially what the transaction is doing right now. In keeping with uh, the linked list, we also need an origin for that linked list. We need a, a sort of start point, uh, the, the root of the linked list. Uh, and so this transaction, this big table of transactions, also needs to keep track of, of uh, the, the last log entry to uh, be issued by that given transaction. Any questions up to this point? All right. So, so far, two major components. The log, and then a, a table of all of the transactions. And the final component in this big system is the buffer manager. So recall, uh, last class we, we introduced this component as kind of the chunk, that keep the, the component of the system that keeps track of what's in memory uh, and, and uh, pretty much everything to do with uh, keeping the memory synchronized with disk. Uh, you can kind of think of this as the virtual memory manager in an operating system. So what is this guy going to keep track of? Well, it's going to keep track of all of the pages that are currently in memory, all of the, the data pages. It's going to keep track of what the status of each of these pages is, whether, it's, uh, whether there's writes pending to it uh, or whether it's uh, clean. If there are writes pending to it, we want to keep track of the last log entry that actually performed a modification to this, this page. And then finally, there's uh, not in the buffer manager itself, but there's the data that is currently loaded into memory. Any questions? All right, so what are the three components? Log. Log. Oh, you, you've, been, you've been active. Someone else. I, wanted, I want more. There's more than one person in this class. I know there are more people awake. The, the transaction manager, one. The log. And the buffer manager, good. OK, so we've got the log, we've got the transaction table, and we've got the buffer manager. Each of these are currently, uh, e each of these are kind of the, the major components that we're going to be working with. OK, so let's say something breaks. The system crashes. We've got some junk on disk. And we want to be able to take that junk that's sitting on disk and bring it uh, back into a consistent state. But it's not just the stuff that's on disk that we need to keep track of. We've got some stuff in memory. So once again, what do we need to recover in memory? What are the components of the system that are kept in memory? The transaction table and the buffer manager. So both of these guys have state that needs to be brought back into memory. So the first step of the recovery process is going to be to take a look at each of these components and try and bring the, uh, recover the state that each of them were in at the time that the crash occurred. So how do we do that? OK, so there's uh, two components that are in memory, one component on disk. Let's use the component on disk to go uh, back in time and recover everything that we've, we've lost. Perfect. But this log, we've been appending to it uh, every time we do something. So this leads us to a little bit of a problem, because well, what if the database has been running without a hitch for years? So. Yes, we need to scan the log, but how far back do we need to go? Do we know when we can stop? Yes? 
Great. So uh, potentially, it, it, let me uh, let me. Add, so if we didn't have any checkpoints, how far back would we need to go? To the very start. So potentially, we might need to go all the way to the start. But um, well, simple thing that we can do to uh, streamline this process is periodically uh, take the state that we keep in memory, the transaction table and the buffer manager, and save them to disk. Uh, by the way, if uh, it's not obvious, uh, X act means transaction. Um, I don't know why that they use that abbreviation, but it makes things a lot shorter. Um, so the idea is that you want to periodically take um, everything in the transaction table and flush it uh, into the log. And that way, well, you don't have to scan to the very beginning. You just scan to that one point, uh, to the last successful checkpoint. Now, what do I mean by successful checkpoint? How could a checkpoint be unsuccessful? What do you mean by uh, there are pending rights? What do you mean by pending rights? Uh, there are pending commits. I see. So the transaction table actually, um, the transaction table itself would keep track of that. Uh, would keep track of the fact that there are some transactions uh, that have not yet committed. So we we have uh, a list of all of the, the. What is the transaction table? It's a list of transactions. Uh, together with whatever state they are currently in. Uh, either the transaction is currently running, uh, the transaction is in the process of being committed, uh, in the process of being aborted, um, and I think there's a handful of other uh, potential states. But if a transaction was currently active and not, um, not flushed to disk, then that, uh, that would be in the transaction table. So assuming we have the, uh, a way to recover uh, the entire transaction table, we would know that there was a transaction pending. Um, but that doesn't address the, the root question, which is the checkpoint itself. How is it possible for the checkpoint not to be successful? So how many IOs is it going to take for uh, for me to flush the entire transaction table to disk. Well, yes, it depends, and it depends on the size. Uh, so what happens if the transaction table is big enough that it actually takes me two IOs to do? Yes, so I could potentially crash uh, immediately after I crash without fully writing the entire transaction table to disk. So what do I need to do? I need to keep track of uh, the fact that I need to keep track of a, a couple of different features of the, the transaction table. Um, so let me ask you this question. What should I record when I, I perform a, uh, a checkpoint? When should I consider that transaction to be successful? At what point would I consider it to be successful? OK. Uh, so once the entire transaction table has been written to disk, uh, that is a successful, trans uh, a successful checkpoint. But what happens if, do I want to, so here, here's kind of the big question. Do I want to stop the entire system while I'm performing that checkpoint? Do I want to allow other operations to continue as I'm performing the checkpoint? Yes. So I don't want to block up the entire system. This, this checkpointing process is poten uh, potentially going to involve many, many IOs, depending on how many transaction, transactions I have going. And it's going to, take a while. And I don't want to block up the entire system. So if I flush the entire transaction table to disk and kind of consider the checkpoint to be successful when 
everything has been flushed to disk, what problems could that cause? Right, so I might have uh, T1, T2, So let's say at this point in time, I start writing my transaction to disk. And finally, here it ends. Wow, this is dusty. Um, so I consider it to be successful as of the end point. What happens if transaction two comes along and does a Does it commit? Is this part of the checkpointed data? No. So what will happen in most database systems is they'll actually have two separate log entries uh, pertaining to uh, the commit. There will be a, uh, a, check, a, record, a log entry that gets created when the checkpoint first starts. And this end indicates essentially the point in time where the checkpoint is valid. So the, uh, if the checkpoint is successful, then everything before this point, before the start, is part of the checkpoint. But the checkpoint doesn't become valid until the second record gets written that indicates that, OK, now I've successfully written all of the checkpoint data to disk. Any questions? All right. So you guys are going to all get this completely correct. OK. So once again, there are two kind of stages to the, the, uh, the checkpoint commit. OK, great. So we've, at this point, recovered one of the two components that we need to recover. We've recovered the transaction table. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, so. Basically, as of this point, we can replay all of the log entries that happened after that point and use those log entries to update the transaction table as appropriate. If we get a commit record, well, that tells us how the transaction table changes. If we get another transaction aborting, again, that tells us how the transaction changes. And really, if we get any kind of log record in here, uh, that'll update the transaction table because what's the last component of the transaction table? What are the two things that the transaction table keeps track of? The, the status and the last log entry. So um, basically by replaying the entire log, uh, we can keep track of the status of the transaction and we can also keep track of the, um, we can also keep track of which is the, now the, the last log entry. Start from the checkpoint, replay, and yay, we've recovered the transaction table. What else do we need to do? The buffer manager. So the next thing that we need to do is uh, recover the buffer manager. So how are, we, how, are, ah, how are we going to do that? How have we done everything else? The log. So we're going to replay uh, a bunch of updates in the log. Now, the, the kind of tangential question here is from where? At which point uh, can we start reading from the log? So there's an obvious potential candidate. We could start from the checkpoint. Is that going to be sufficient? No. no. Why? Because uh, suppose the transaction it is committed, uh, it is committed after the checkpoint starting. Mm -hmm. But we don't know the starting point of checkpoint two. So it may be before the checkpoint two. Well, let's say checkpoint two starts somewhere before the check before there, and let's say we have a right to 
A right to B. Um, and then after uh, right to C. So is it safe to simply start replaying from this point? Just do the right to C and be done with it? Why not? Okay, so do we have any guarantee? You're completely right, and let me rephrase that slightly. Do we have any guarantee that these have been flushed to disk? All together? One, two, three. Okay. Just want to make sure you're still awake. It's so quiet in here. Um, all right, so we have no guarantee that these are, have been flushed to disk, to disk yet. Um, which means that there is some possibility that this transaction uh, earlier writes might need to be fleshed back to disk. So, how far back do we need to go? Hmm? Every single transaction that has ever occurred, uh, the suggested answer was uh, to the start of the transaction, uh, the transaction Okay, so uh, we need to go as far back as the last open transaction as of the checkpoint. Okay. Oh, whoops. That's not right. Um, okay, so we go back in time and then we replay a bunch of entries uh, to get ourselves to get the data back to the correct. Uh, the correct state. The last thing that we need to do is ensure consistency. So any transaction that is not yet committed needs to get uh, undone. Um, any writes that were performed, we need to be able to undo those writes. So kind of like we replay all of the transactions, uh, all of the updates in any open transactions, we need to go back and undo every single transaction uh, operation that from a tra every transaction uh, actually this was a question to you guys which transactions do we need to undo? Somewhere in the back. Oh come on this this was on the very first slide which transactions do we need to undo? Hmm? Any transaction that was still open. So every single transaction that, is, that hasn't committed by the time the crash occurred, basically everything that we don't have a commit record for, we need to go back and we need to undo everything that those transactions have done did. So, for those, which log entries do we need to go back and visit? Or better yet, how far back in the log do we need to go? The to the previous uh, commit, what do you mean by that? the previous commit for okay so we need to go back in time basically we need to um, to go back in time to the the do you mean start of the transaction yeah, so uh, you basically need to go back to the, the start of the earliest transaction that is still open. Okay, does, does anyone see a potential problem with this? So re redoing uh, or undoing, is there 
if a transaction aborts and we have to go and undo all of its activities, is this going to be cheap? No. Is there anything that we can do about that? And more precisely, why isn't it going to be cheap? Yeah. A transaction, if we abort a transaction, then we would put it to the state when other, all the values which it has updated were in the previous state. Means some other transaction will be the form of this transaction. Right. So every time we undo one of these operations, there's a number of computations that have to happen. We need to not only figure out uh, what the previous value of, of, uh, of the value that gets written is, we need to also figure out what other transactions have written to that page since then. We need to figure out uh, whether there have been any conflicts. And if we actually don't need to undo that operation because some other transaction came along in the meantime and overwrote the value anyway. So this process of undoing is extremely expensive. And we'd like to have a way of kind of streamlining it a little bit. If we do some work, we'd like to be able to recover that work. So that's where this idea of compensation log records comes in. So the idea is that every time you perform an undo, every time you actually undo a specific operation, you go back and uh, actually log the, the operation, the, the, the fix that you've figured out. You log that fix, and you save that in the log uh, as what's called a compensation log record. So this way, um, when, you're, when you're redoing, when you're replaying the log, essentially step two in this process, you can kind of recover some of the work that you've done to undo the log, uh, to undo uh, the, the transactions that have, have not yet been committed. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah. All right. Let's. So this, just to summarize what we've, what we've discussed, um, there have basically been three stages to this recovery process. Uh, the first stage, we kind of recover the memory, recover the state uh, of the, the, uh, the in-memory state of the database, the transaction table, the buffer manager. Step two, we recover the data, the in-memory data, uh, as it was at the time of the crash. And then in step three, we recover consistency by undoing any operations uh, that weren't successfully committed. The sequence of operations, uh, this three-stage process, is typically referred to as the ARIES recovery algorithm. And it's basically what gets used in pretty much every major database system uh, to date. Um, if there's a crash, uh, there's a crash, three phases. Phase number one, you recover the, the in-memory state of the database. And this is typically called analysis. Uh, step two, you go back in time and replay any log record, uh, any update records since the last um, dirty page in your uh, buffer. And then finally, uh, you go back in time and undo any records up to the last uh, transaction that was still active at the time of the crash. So with that, um, I'm going to say we take a quick five-minute break, and then when, when we come back, I've got an example and some other directions uh, for discussion. Right, so um, like I said, the, uh, what we've discussed today, the, this three-step recovery process, is commonly known as the ARIES recovery algorithm, uh, which, like I said, has three phases. Uh, analyze, or stay step one, uh, redo, or step two, and undo. So let's, let's see an example of this. I have right here a log, uh, a sequence of operations uh, that starts with a checkpoint, um, transaction one performing a, couple, uh, a single write, uh, updating page five. Transaction two then uh, writes to page three, 
Transaction one then aborts. Uh, transaction one does a couple of actions uh, pertaining to that abort, finally ends, and then transaction three comes in, writes to P1, transaction two then writes to P5. At the start of this uh, transaction, um, at the start of this whole process, transactions one and two are active uh, as of the checkpoint. Uh, a couple of these arrows uh, basically refer to the previous log pointers. So for example, log record uh, 45 is pointing back to log record 30 because that's the last log entry that was performed by transaction one. Any questions on this log? All right. So let's go through the three phases. Start with analysis. So the very first thing we're going to do is starting with the last checkpoint, uh, which gives us, uh, says that transaction one and transaction two are currently active, and their last log entry is somewhere prior to the checkpoint. Um, we're going to start then by replaying the log from that point and updating both the buffer manager's internal state as well as the transaction table's uh, internal state. So the first operation uh, as of the checkpoint's end is that transaction one has written P5. Okay, well that's a record for transaction one. So we're gonna save that in our transaction table. Then transaction two writes to uh, page three now we have a record for transaction two. Uh, keep in mind, the, the less than zero, uh, that just means that I'm kind of too lazy to write out a, a, a previous uh, state. So somewhere in here is an operation for transaction one. And as of the checkpoint, uh, as of the checkpoint, the, this less than zero just means that there is some log entry here that, car, uh, that this would be pointing to. Uh, all right, so uh, one, keep in mind, we're also updating the buffer manager. Uh, page five was updated by transaction one, so we're gonna keep track of the last uh, operation to update that. And page three was updated, so we're gonna keep track of the last operation to update that. And moving on, um, we're going to undo uh, transaction one's operation on uh, page five. And then as of this point, transaction one has officially ended. So, well, transaction one is no longer a matter of concern because we've replayed the log up to that point. So we can remove it from our transaction table. In fact, as of the crash, it would no longer have been in the transaction table because it ended. Uh, moving on, transaction three starts up uh, and performs its first write. And then uh, transaction two performs another write. So finally, uh, we have all of the records for transaction two and trans transaction three, as well as the buffer manager state uh, brought back up to speed um, with each of the pages and the, the last transaction to modify it. Now, a couple of questions. Why do we still consider page, uh, why do we still consider page five to be uh, dirty even before we get to this last step of the analysis process? So, replay, replay. So right here, We've undone the effects of transaction one. We've undone uh, operation 10. Why are we still considering page five to be dirty? Yes. In memory, yes. But a better question is on disk. What is 
uh, what is the version of page five that is currently on disk? Do we know that? No. So, so a better question, uh, or rephrasing the same question, this modifies page five. This also modifies page five. Now, which is the correct version of, of page five? The version that the version that this thing wrote, or the version that this thing wrote? Yeah, this version, right? So everything that's down here uh, between operations forty and sixty, uh, as at least as of this point in the log. Now. As it so happens, that's equivalent to the version of P5 that happened between uh, operation 10 and the last thing that wrote to, to uh, page 5. But there's a, uh, there's a possibility that we did a flush somewhere between here, uh, between these two operations. In fact, we don't know whether we flushed, uh, whether the last flush was somewhere between here uh, in, in this range or somewhere before operation 10. If we never flushed between these two operations, this isn't doing anything. But if we did flush somewhere in here, then what's on disk is the older version. So we need to actually keep, uh, once we've loaded this back into memory, once we've replayed the log up to that point, even after we've kind of replayed this undo, there's still a, a possibility that's, that what's on disk is incorrect. Now, we don't necessarily immediately need to flush it back to disk. After all, we're buffering things. We're keeping, uh, keeping things in memory. And even during the undo process, we can keep a buffer in memory. But we need to then keep track of the fact that this page, uh, page 5, is dirty. Okay. Um, note one other thing. What are we not seeing for transaction three? A start point. So we're not seeing that transaction three has started until transaction three performs a write. Is that okay? Yes, why? Okay, so if the transaction is purely reading up to that point, then, well, it hasn't done anything, so it can't possibly have affected the state of the database. What happens if the transaction was open before here? So remember, for the analysis phase, we're only going up to the last checkpoint. So what happens if uh, we had another transaction for that uh, started somewhere before begin checkpoint. Can we disprove that such a transaction could possibly have existed, given the information that we have here? You mean, uh, OK, so how, how um, let me rephrase that slightly. Uh, If there was a transaction for that perform, um, so the, uh, recall there are two. Um, if there was a transaction for that wrote to the database that modified the database in some way, would there be some some? Uh, how to phrase this? So recall in the analysis phase we're only going up to begin checkpoint. So anything that happened before begin checkpoint in the log doesn't matter, or at least doesn't matter to the, the analysis phase. Now what I'm asking is, is that safe? If there was another transaction, let's say transaction four, that had written to the database, how could we tell that, uh, how would we know that that transaction had written to the database, even if we don't see any evidence of it after this point? 
Yeah. Professor, after the checkpoint has been created, hmm? so why are we concerned that like, if our transaction has made an update to the database? Because if it is uh, at the start, we have the transaction table. It is not in the transaction table. There you go. It's not. That, uh, is a bit, yeah, uh, that is precisely what, what I was asking about. Um, so the, if the, if there had been a transaction prior to the checkpoint, it would have been recorded in the checkpoint. And if the transaction uh, occurs after or starts after the checkpoint, but doesn't actually do anything, then that's fine because it didn't do anything. There's, there's no lasting impact of that transaction. And it would have been aborted because there was a crash. So in either case, there's no way that a hypothetical transaction four that we haven't seen could possibly affect the results, uh, the, the state of the database. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Uh, replay, replay. Okay, so we've now recovered everything that we need in memory. We have the full state of the transaction table, and we have the full state of the buffer, of the buffer manager. So what's the next phase? Redo. We want to be able to uh, recover the full actual data that is uh, residing in the database. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to start with every single page that got modified. So in this case, page 5 was mod uh, the first operation to modify it. The first log entry to modify it, excuse me, was update 10. So we're going to replay that and every subsequent operation starting from basically the earliest page that the buffer manager points to. The buffer manager points to the first, page, uh, the first modification to every page. So we're going to basically replay the entire log from the earliest thing that the buffer manager points to. So reapply uh, P, uh, uh, T1's update to P5, reapply T2's update to P3, reapply the undo, reapply T3's write, and then reapply T2's write. And this brings us back to the current state of the data in memory. Any questions? Yes, so the, the first phase, analysis, brings our transaction table and the non-data portions of the buffer manager back up to their current state. Then once we've recovered the in-memory portion of the database, the, the buffer manager and the transaction table, then we want to recover the data that we're keeping track of. And so we redo the log from the earliest transaction record that we have, uh, uh, we have marked as being dirty. So it's possible that might be from some point before the, the checkpoint, the last checkpoint, it might be some point after. Any other questions? All right. So uh, let's see, where are we? Right. So now let's take a look at the undo process. So the last phase, uh, so the first two phases, we uh, recovered the in-memory state, then we recovered the data in the database. And the final state, the, the final stage of the recovery process, we're going to undo any transactions that have not yet been committed. So we're going to take a look at the uh, transaction table, and we're going to look at all of the transactions that were still open at the time of the crash. Recall, we've recovered this in the analysis phase. And along with the transactions themselves, we have a record of the last operation performed by each transaction that's still open. So this means, OK, we have two specific operations that we need to undo. We're going to go back through the log and visit every single log entry 
um, in this linked list that we're going to basically traverse the linked list of all operations performed by every single uh, still open transaction and well, undo them exactly as we would undo during an abort. So, okay, let's uh, visit each of these. Let's start from uh, the last update before the crash. Uh, operation 50, uh, sorry, operation 60, uh, and we're going to undo that. And as before, we're going to write a compensation log record to record the fact that we've just undone something and record specifically what we're undoing. Uh, T2's write to P5. And we're going to keep moving backwards. So the next thing that we need to uh, keep, sorry, uh, so T2's prior operation, recall this log entry keeps track of the, more, the most recent log entry that T2 had prior to operation 60, and that's operation 20. So we're going to add 20 to our uh, list of, of things to undo. All right, so now we've uh, undone operation T3. We've written its uh, CLR. And now operation, uh, that's the last operation that we have for T3. So we can, we're happy. We can write another record uh, saying, OK, T3 has been successfully aborted. And now the system crashes. Well, what do we do now? Well, the database comes back up, and what do we need to do? Analysis. So we're going to recover everything up to this point. So all of this is safely committed to the log. So basically, we can recover the transaction table. T3 has been successfully aborted by now. We can ignore that, drop that from the table because of that record. And then we can, uh, all that's left is T2. So essentially, by uh, because that crash occurred, or uh, even though that crash occurred, we can still get back to precisely this point, uh, both in memory and uh, on disk. OK, so OK, the crash occurred. Great. We, we still we get back to this stage where we know that the last thing that we need to undo is record 20. So we'll go back, figure out what record 20 is, and we undo it. And that's the last thing that we need to do. Uh, so we can write down uh, transaction two has safely uh, committed, uh, safely been undone. All right. Any questions on this example? All right. So that's large part of what I wanted to cover today. Uh, one thing that got, got brought up on uh, last Wednesday that I kind of want to briefly mention, these logs are useful for a number of other purposes. So in addition to uh, recovery, you can also use the log records as a form of replication. Every time you change something with a log, uh, that log record represents a very compact, very small representation of how the database has changed. And so uh, what you'll see in a lot of uh, consumer, uh, a lot of uh, commercial database systems, Oracle, IBM, uh, DB2, uh, SQL Server, uh, even Postgres uh, and MySQL have this facility by which you can um, ship logs between two different uh, servers. And then uh, the second server essentially just replays the log as it gets it. What does that get you? Yep, so you can basically get two copies of the original database with the same, uh, the, this, this second database is not just a replica, uh, sorry, the, the second database is effectively a replica of the first. Uh, it can serve requests that potentially need uh, slightly weaker uh, concurrency guarantees. Or, it, or even better, uh, if your primary crashes, the secondary can kind of kick in and there's a whole bunch of infrastructures in place that will uh, allow it to immediately take over for the primary. Um, one other thing, uh, this, is, this is not really 
a major uh, content component of the course, but something that uh, is kind of an interesting, just something that I find to be an interesting question. Uh, we briefly discussed this idea that uh, we're using a very, very limited form of transactions, uh, you know, just black box reads and writes. And uh, what we'll hopefully have time to discuss towards the end of the, the term is kind of more general models of transactions. So uh, what if you have the ability to actually inspect in more detail what goes on inside a transaction? Not just that a write was performed, but why that write was performed. What um, Was it uh, an increment of a particular attribute, or was it just a complete overwrite from outside of the system? You can kind of handle those two differently. And something just open-ended, uh, if you're interested, I'd be happy to discuss this offline. Why, uh, what kind of ways are there of doing better? Uh, one kind of thing that I do want you to take away from this, uh, there is a, a term, what happens in most databases is called physical logging. So you're logging exactly the, the writes that have occurred. And one kind of consequence of this more general transaction model, you can uh, keep track of not, uh, not the specific writes that have occurred, but the queries that caused those writes, you can do a lot more in terms of reordering. You can do a lot more in terms of recovery. Uh, you can do things a lot more efficiently. A little more complex to do so, but you can do things much more efficiently. So basically the, the open question here is, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the term for this, the, the term for logging, not the, the specific rights, uh, is logical logging. And there, there's kind of a whole slew of cool things that you can do once you start uh, keeping track of the, the functions, uh, the, the update functions, and not the, uh, the, the specific rights themselves. So with that, uh, any final questions? All right, uh, you can pick up your, uh, your uh, homework assignments from uh, Shunak in the back. <laughs>